Welcome to St Nicholas Barthampton for our live stream service. Last Thursday was Ascension Day. Jesus' first disciples saw him after he rose from the dead going up into heaven. So he wasn't with them anymore. He told them to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit to give them power to take the good news of Jesus out to the whole world. Then after 10 days, they were given the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit now, but we pray for him to do more, to bring more people to know the Lord Jesus. Just like the disciples waiting, we trust God to give us all we need. The famous Psalm says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. Our faithful God gives us all we need. Normally in St Nicholas when we meet in church, the first 15 minutes of our service 
would be all together and then uh, the rest of the service in church is mainly for the for the grown-ups intended for the grown-ups and meeting virtually like this it's the same there's something specially for the children as well but instead of the children going out to do that after our all age part of the service the children have already done it from 10 o'clock on zoom and if anyone's missed that and would like to come next week do get in touch and we can give you the zoom invitation but now we're in our all age part of the service and we have our Australian friend Colin giving us a, a particularly Australian uh, song and uh, think about God's goodness and care for us <laughs> I'm Colin, two, three, I'm counting the hairs on my head, four, you've got to really concentrate, wait, was it that one, was that four, or was that three, I've lost count now, there's quite a few hairs on there, all right, I, I know, I count something else, um, last time I went to the beach, I brought some sand home in a bag, and I thought, well, I'll count a little bit at a time and see if I can count all the little grains of sand on the beach. So I'll start with, there's only a few here. So uh, one, two, three. Actually, they do all look quite the same. These, oh, they do look the same. I can't remember which one I was up to. That's going to take forever. I have to do it later. <laughs> um, what else could I count? I know. I could go outside and count the leaves on the trees, but think of all the forests in the world and all the trees in the forests and all the leaves on the trees. Too many. There are some things when you think about them, they just seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. What about people? There's so many people, aren't there? Like if I think about my family, there's my wife Robin, and then there's me, and then there's Elliot, my boy, and his wife Claire, and then Laura and her husband Tim, and then there's Emily, and then there's Riley, and so that's, that's eight, and that's just our family. And then there's more families, there's more families next door, and there's people down the street, and in our city, and then there's lots of cities in our country, and there's lots of countries in the world, so many people. Well, let me read something God says about people in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There's so many people in the world, and they're all made by God in his image. That means he makes them to be like him, to love and to live and to do good like God. Now, I can't count all the people in the world, can I? Mm, let me think. No. But can God? Yes. And he doesn't just count people. He doesn't just, he doesn't just know how many there are. He knows them, each one. It's amazing. He loves them and he cares for them and he sees them all. And you know what? He calls them. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and to save us from our sins. All right. We should listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. It's something about how precious people are. All right. Let me have a look. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 to 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. <laughs> Did you hear that? The hairs of our head are numbered. God sees us and he knows us. And sparrows, well, there's lots of sparrows and lots of birds. And God says he sees each one of them fall. And if he sees them... We don't need to be afraid because we are worth much more than sparrows. It's very good to know that, isn't it? Now, God cares for the sparrows. God cares for the ah, ah, the crow, 
the old black crow, and the dig, 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 the wombat, and the wriggle, wriggle, gecko, and the kangaroo. And there's a song about that, and I'm gonna sing it now. Maybe you know it. There are actions. It's hard to do the actions when you're playing the guitar, but anyway, I might try, see what happens. All right. The old black crow. There's an old black crow sitting in the gum tree. He's plump and he's well fed. A beetle here, a cicada there is the black crow's daily bread. I think it should be said there's a lord who cares for the old black crow, the dig, the wombat, the gecko, and the kangaroo. And one thing sure, we are worth much more to the god who cares for people too. Skiddly do. I just added that bit. All right, what's next? The wombat. Mrs. Wombat digs, come on, herself a little burrow to keep her warm and dry. It's a home sweet home that she's made her own, better than money can buy. And here's the reason why. There's a lord who cares for the old black crow. Wombat, the wombat, the gecko and the kangaroo. And one thing sure, we are worth much more to the god who cares for people too. Skiddly do. Gecko sticks its tongue out. Can you stick your tongue out? That's right. <laughs> the gecko lives in the sands of the desert where it's very dry and hot. He's small and frail with a stumpy tail, but hungry he is not. All he needs he's got. There's a lord who cares for the old black crow, the wombat, the gecko and the kangaroo. And one thing sure, we are worth much more to the god who cares for people too. Skiddly do. All right, last one's the kangaroo. Ready? The lord cares too for the kangaroo. I think we all can see. The worth much more to the living Lord is you and you and me and me and you and you and me. There's a Lord who cares for the old black crow, the wombat, the gecko and the kangaroo. And one thing sure, we are worth much more to the God who cares for people too. Skiddly do, skiddly do. Did you do all those actions? I think I did some of them, but I had to play the guitar as well. Well, it's precious to know that God cares for the world around us and he cares for us in a very special way. I think we should pray now. It's wonderful that he hears our prayers, isn't it? So let's talk to God. I'm gonna close my eyes so I can think about what I'm saying. Our great almighty God, you made us before we were made, you were, and you are from everlasting to everlasting. Thank you for the preciousness of people that you made us in your image, that you know us. Thank you that you sent Jesus and you called us to know him, that he saves us from our sins, saves us from sickness and badness and sadness. Thank you that our hair, the hairs of our, our head are numbered, that you care for the old black crow and the wombat, the gecko and the kangaroo, and you care for us, our Lord and our God and our Father. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Seeing we have a great high priest who's passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith and make our confession to our Heavenly Father. Let us return to the Lord our God and say to him, 
Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father in heaven, for your great love and mercy that you've promised because of Jesus to forgive everyone who trusts him. So please strengthen that faith in us and help us to live with Jesus as our King. Amen. Great, well that brings us to the end of the all age part of the service and um, so children you're welcome to stay with us or if you'd like to do something else whatever's okay with your um, your grown-ups at home and uh, we'll carry on now with a lovely old hymn come thou fount of every blessing god is the the fountain that all the 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 water of everything good comes out of to bless us and give us what we need Uh, we can't be together at the moment. So here we have Peter and Andy Lloyd Williams, uh, long standing members of St Nicholas's. Hello, Peter and Andy, good to see you. Thank you. Thank, um, you. thank you very much for, for joining us and inviting us into your home um, for this little conversation. I, uh, how, how are things at home at the moment? You've had a, a significant change in the last week, haven't you? Oh yes, well, with my new stairlift, yes. Yes, it's quite a, it makes quite a difference to 
well, the amount of exercise I take. So, uh, uh, but it, it's I'm getting used to it now, and it's jolly good. And I, I enjoy uh, not having to walk up and down the stairs because that was becoming a bit difficult. Mm, so lovely. that's good. I'm glad to have it. And the, the family, Martin and Robert, have been uh, persuading us to have it for uh, quite a long time now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, the boys were leaning on. So oh, that's, that's very good to have it. I yes. thought you were going to say the family have been coming round and having a go on it, having a play on the new toy. <laughs> no, of course they're not supposed to be in, but uh, yes, Robert's, Robert's had a quick peek. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you've lived in, in Barthampton for how many years? Uh, since 1968. 52 years. Yes. You're well known and loved in the church family at St Nicholas's, um, Peter, having been a, a reader in the church. And Indeed. So, so, sorry, my phone keeps ringing. I need to try and stop that. <laughs> and um, how, how did you, I mean, I'd, I'd like to ask about how you first came to, to be involved in St Nicholas's, but it was about in the Christian faith as well. How did you first come to know the Lord? Uh, in my early days as a child, you mean? Well, you tell us. <laughs> yes, well, as I say, I, I was brought up in a Christian family. Um, my grandfather was a Baptist minister. My brother, younger brother, and his wife, who's American, are both Methodist minister. And Martin, of course, is uh, Anglican now, uh, Archdeacon, um, right in the nurse down in, uh, in Sussex. So uh, I have never really not... Uh, not being a Christian, I've grown up as a Christian, and still, um, thanks be to God, I still am. Yes, yes I, I was away at boarding school, and um, 250 miles away from home, and we were allowed to go into the chapel just before supper. And so Every I, day? Yes, we were allowed to go, um, right. it, was, it was just an open any, for any all day. of us. Right. Yes, and uh, so... Uh, a friend and I, or a group of friends, we always went in for ten minutes to um, to say a prayer before supper, and uh, it it was comforting when you were so far away from home. And, right. Uh, developed ever since. And so, and so you you've been involved in in St Nicholas Church for um, forty years, more than that. No, since nineteen sixty eight. When we came to look for houses, um, we were staying the night, I think, and we went to the morning service here, uh, having been down on the Saturday looking for houses. So we went to 50 the years. Service. Yeah. Right. And uh, um, things are, are different in different ways for, for all of us with lockdown and the coronavirus situation at the moment. Could you um, tell us about one, one thing you're finding difficult or challenging about that? Uh, well, missing the sport, um, obviously, and um, live music, that, that is um, a, a great loss in our lives. Um, and also yes. not being able to go to church, of course. That, that, that's, a huge, that, that's a huge loss. And all the groups, in, in my case, Steps in Faith, uh, we are not able to meet, uh, as, of course, are the other, the other home groups. So we do miss those enormously, meeting together and discussing the faith. Um, that, that's, great, uh, that's a great loss. And I think everyone in the group feels that way too. Yeah. Mm. And, and can you find something positive in some, share an encouragement with us? Getting a lot of sewing done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> well, what are you working on at the moment with the sewing? Oh, uh, well, I've just finished an embroidery. Um, I'll, I'll Can we just... see it? Yep. Uh. <laughs> Finding the right. Oh, here it, it is. Yeah. Beautiful butterfly. Yes, which of course um, represents um, the resurrection. Yes. Uh, but all of us in U3A were all doing a butterfly in some form. Right. So, um, Yes, yeah, so uh, quite nice to get that finished, and uh, a lot of other sewing as well. Oh, lovely! See, Peter's cracking on with his crosswords. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still managing to, uh, to uh, 
deal with the Times Crossroad, which is, um, I've been doing it for so long now that uh, it would be unthinkable not to, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> right, very good. And um, finally, anything particular you'd like us to pray for you? Any... I think for um, the earliest possible um, return to some kind of normality. In particular, I'm uh, concerned that uh, there is still an argument about when uh, schools ought to resume lessons and so on, because I, I think that the, uh, the arguments are not helpful. I would like to see people agreeing and yeah. uh, going on with things so that we can, we can do that and, and do it together uh, rather than argue about what should be this. And I, I'm also slightly concerned about the, the, the panic that the media has engendered. Um, and that's not, I think, at all helpful. Some people don't want to go. They don't want to go out again now in case they catch uh, the virus. Yes, uh, that's a huge mistake. Because we need to be tolerant of different, so uh, different attitudes and different dispositions that different Certainly people do. have. And mm, uh, good things to pray for. Thank you. Mm, yes. Well, it's lovely to to see you both and include you in in our service. Um, thank you very much, Peter and Andy. Father God, we thank you for Peter and Andy. Thank you for your faithfulness to them, that, uh, as Peter said, by your goodness, uh, he's still a Christian. Thank you for watching over them, and we pray that you would continue to help them, uh, give them what they need. And thank you for Peter's concerns that he mentioned there, his concern um, about how society is coping and recovering from this big challenge. As the schools look to resuming, we pray for your blessing on teachers and pupils and everyone organising how to do school with social distancing and families that have those new challenges. And we pray that you would help us all to agree and to face the problems together and not turn on each other and complain and criticise each other. We pray for discussion to be constructive in government and in throughout our society and in the church. For Jesus' sake. Amen. If you've got your Bible, um, now's a good time to turn to it and find the prophecy of Isaiah. Um, just beyond the middle of the Bible in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 22 is where we're going to have our, Jan's going to read to us now. If you haven't got a Bible, the words are up on the screen and you can follow there. Um, and it's, uh, we've heard in the last couple of weeks some oracles of Isaiah against the enemy nations. And today's reading has the enigmatic heading, an oracle concerning the Valley of Vision. And it's not immediately clear who it's about, but a few verses in, we realise that he's talking, shockingly, about Jerusalem, the Lord's own city. The first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 22, verses 1 to 25. An oracle concerning the Valley of Vision. What troubles you now that you have gone up on the roofs? O town full of commotion, O city of tumult and reverie. You slain were not killed by the sword, nor did they die in battle. All you, your leaders have fled together. They have been captured without using the bow. All you who were caught were taken prisoner together, having fled while the enemy was still far away. Therefore I said, turn away from me. Let the, you, me weep bitterly. Do not try to console me over the destruction of my people. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, has a day of tumult and trampling and terror in the valley of vision, a day of battering down walls and of crying out to the mountains. Elam takes the quiver with her characters and chariots and horses. Kerr overcovers the shield. Your choicest valleys are full of chariots, and horsemen are posted at the city gates. 
the defences of Judah are stripped away. And you looked in that day to the weapons in the palace of the forest. You saw that the city of David had many breaches in its defences. You stored up water in the lower pool. You counted the buildings in Jerusalem and tore down houses to strengthen the wall. You built a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but you did not look to the one who made it or have regard for the one who planned it long ago. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, called you on that day to weep and to wail, to t tear out your hair and put on sackcloth, but see, there is joy in reverie, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. The Lord Almighty has revealed this in my hearing. Till your dying day, this sin will not be atoned for, says the Lord, the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. Go, say to this steward, to Shebna, who is in charge of the palace. What are you doing here? And who gave you permission to cut out a grave for yourself, hewing your grave on the height and chiselling your resting place in the rock? Beware, the Lord is about to take firm hold of you and hurl you away, O you mighty man. He will roll you up tightly like a ball and throw you into a large country. There you will die and there your splendid chariots will remain. You disgrace your master's house. I will dispose you from your office and you will be ousted from your position. In that day I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut and what he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will be a seat of honour for the house of his father. All the glory of his family will hang on him, its offspring and offshoots, all its lesser vessels, from the bowls to the, all the jars. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and fall, and the loud hanging on it will cut, be cut down. The Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to Lord. God. The second reading is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon, in all his splendour, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? or What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? 
For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be to God. The king of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I'm his and he is mine forever. Let's sing together. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Bring that word down to our hearts and may it stand firm there. Increase our faith and may we take joy in knowing you, loving Father. Amen. Short-termism is in the long run a disastrous approach to life. It can be so hard to plan ahead or to have a long-term big picture in mind as we live our daily lives but long-term vision is essential as essential in life as it is on any journey where we need to know not only where to plant our feet or which way to turn at the next junction but where our destination is and in which direction should we be looking to make progress we used to plan journeys by looking at maps and having an idea of the overall route before we started. Now, most of us tend to put the destination into a sat-nav and only think one step at a time. So if sat-nav crashes, we're left helpless. Sometimes the short term has to take over our thinking and action. A child steps out into the road and we swerve to avoid them rather than sticking to our plan of not turning till we get to the junction. Coronavirus threw a spanner in the works of many of our plans and we had to respond in an environment of uncertainty, unable to plan very far ahead because by the time we get to the next month, so much might have changed again. With hindsight, we may criticise the government's approach at the start of the crisis, but at the time, we couldn't see any better than they could. 
what was coming and how it would be. In last week's prophecy, Isaiah spoke to both the long horizon and the short term. Eventually, he said, Egypt would be included in God's people. But for now, don't make an alliance with them, he told the leaders of Judah. In the short term, Egypt would be under God's judgment. In today's oracle, Isaiah speaks to Jerusalem. He calls it the Valley of Vision, a puzzling phrase. Normally, a mountaintop is where you have longer vision. And Jerusalem is on the top of a hill, so the title Valley of Vision is ironic. A valley can be a dark place like the 23rd Psalms, Valley of the Shadow of Death. And maybe Isaiah felt he was in a dark place like that as the Lord gave him a vision about Jerusalem and its future. He highlights four mistakes that could be seen in Jerusalem in his day, all of them arising from a short-sighted outlook. Before we come to those mistakes and look at chapter 22, let's just notice a couple of things from the chapter we missed out in our readings, chapter 21. First, it has an enigmatic heading as well, like today's oracle, the desert by the sea. Puzzling at first sight, as was the Valley of Vision. Chapter 21 is again about Babylon, which is in a fertile alluvial plain, well watered, down by the sea, but it would be judged by God and become a desert. Then there's the prophecy about Edom in verse 11. Watchman, what's left of the night? As though the questioner has woken up, it's still dark, and just as we might look at the clock to see what stage of the night we're at, he asks the watchman who's been awake, how long till morning? A bit like the children in the back seat asking, are we nearly there? My parents used to give us riddles for an answer to that question. And Isaiah the watchman replies, morning is coming, but also the night. If you would ask, then ask and come back yet again. The meaning of it seems to be that the nations are misunderstanding their troubled times and asking, where is everything going as greater darkness and uncertainty envelop them? How much longer will this night last? The answer is an unspecified time of waiting. Release will come, but there's more darkness to be endured first. It strikes me that this is illustrated in our present situation of lockdown continuing for a limited but unknown time. And all of that in turn illustrates the big sweep of history where we know morning will come. We know Christ will return, but we don't know when. And until then, there is more darkness, suffering and death to endure as we wait with hope. The New Testament book of Hebrews calls that hope an anchor for the soul. That long term view, knowing Jesus is coming again and going to put everything right, equips us for enduring life's storms. So what are the four mistakes made in Jerusalem? Back to Isaiah chapter 22. The first one is celebrating short-term deliverance but refusing to accept what lies ahead. Here's a bit of history we'll read later on in Isaiah sometime. Chapters 36 to 37 where the Assyrians, having defeated the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC and invaded Judah, besieged Jerusalem 20 years later. Those chapters are duplicated in 2 Kings 18 and the incident also described in 2 Chronicles. They relate a very important event in the life of God's people. Isaiah foretells a rescue and his prophecy is fulfilled in Isaiah 37, 36. The angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. 
So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Maybe that was what the people were celebrating in Isaiah 22, when the people have gone up on their roofs, the town full of commotion, a city of tumult and revelry. Then Isaiah's field of vision suddenly changes and he talks about the revelry being turned to shame. He's talking about the future, but he's using the perfect tense, your leaders have fled together. Whereas in English that normally represents an action in the future, uh, in the past time, in Hebrew, Isaiah is using the prophetic perfect tense, describing what he has seen in his vision of the future, which is sure to heaven, sure to happen, and has already happened in his vision. Though Judah had been delivered, God would sadly hand them over to the Babylonians who would besiege and defeat Jerusalem in 597 BC, leading to its destruction 10 years later. It's the terrible thing you can read about in 2 Kings 24. That's why Isaiah is weeping bitterly in verse 4 of today's reading. And what about us? Do we have big celebrations over small short-term victories whilst burying our heads in the sand about the long-term future. I don't claim to have the vision for how bad things will be socially, politically or economically as we move into what people keep calling the new normal. Maybe we should have more celebration over the survival of the NHS and the fall in infection rates and death rates. Or maybe there's worse to come. I don't know. But what the Lord has revealed to me, and to you as well, if you read his word, is an eternal perspective. You can't get more long-term than that. And the long-term future, for those who don't know the Lord Jesus, the Saviour, is desperately grim. There may be things that we can do to help our community's short-term needs and we can rejoice over any reduction in poverty, improvement in education, progress in addressing mental health issues, breakthroughs in medical research. But the thing that brings rejoicing in heaven, Jesus tells us, is when a sinner repents. The long-term future for any believer in Jesus is wonderfully bright. Any church needs to remember this as we respond to the needs of society. There are short-term needs and there are long-term needs. There's a danger of churches in this country taking our eye off the ball as we support the government's message to stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Of course, we must support that. But that, the short term thing, is not all. We have something greater to offer as well because we can see the long term need. Saving lives or postponing death would be another way to put it, is not our big long term goal. We have something to offer the world that is far more valuable, the gospel of Jesus, which saves lives beyond death. The second mistake Isaiah saw being made in Jerusalem was looking to human plans and resources, but not acknowledging God as their supplier. The big achievement of King Hezekiah, for which he is remembered, is his tunnel. You can still uh, walk along it under the old city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah's tunnel is half a kilometre long with a gradient of 0.1%. It was hewn out of solid rock by teams of labourers with pickaxes from both ends of the tunnel who somehow met in the middle. Nobody's quite sure how they managed to do it, maybe by tapping on the rock and listening for each other's hammers. It was an engineering marvel and brought Jerusalem 
a great sense of security. Its purpose was to bring water from the protected Gihon Spring to the lower pool in the city and then have its overflow drain away into the porous rock rather than out into the valley as it was previously flowing. So if an enemy besieged the city, those inside could last for ages with fresh water whilst the attackers had no access to water. It was a defensive masterstroke. Scholars reckon it was done in less than four years, maybe as little as nine months. Maybe it's possible that the revelry in Isaiah 22 verse 2 was celebration when those two teams of diggers met in the middle. At the same time, with the Assyrians looming and threatening to besiege, Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem frantically shored up their defences. They cannibalised people's houses, we read in verse 10, knocking them down to get the stone to bolster the city walls. With walls, weapons and a water supply, who needed anything else? Well, that was their problem. What looked like engineering and strategic prudent brilliance was their ultimate folly. God had promised to protect them. When he gave the city to his people in the first place, God knew what water supply he had created for it. Hezekiah didn't create the water, he diverted it. Jerusalem became locked down into this near horizon of their own activism which became the enemy of faith. There's nothing wrong with activity and, and technology itself, nothing wrong with strategic thinking, but the people were using their God-given gifts but the problem was they were relying on those gifts and forgetting God's promises. So we need to ask ourselves, do we have this kind of limited vision and DIY activist salvation? As long as I've got my health, that's the main thing, we say. But that is not the main thing. Or, I just need to provide for my family and earn enough money to give them a secure future. We can't give them a secure future anyway. The best gift we can give our children and grandchildren is knowledge of the Lord Jesus, who can give them a secure future for eternity. The third mistake Isaiah saw in Jerusalem happened when people finally realised how desperate their situation was for the future. Fatalistic feasting in the, mis in the face of danger, but no repenting and seeking God's mercy. Have a look at verse 12. The Lord, the Lord Almighty called you on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth but see, there is joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. Whereas in the second mistake we saw activism and a denial of faith, now we see escapism, which is a denial of repentance. Oh, there's nothing we can do. God's punishing us. We're going to die, the people in Jerusalem were saying. Correctly. So let's enjoy what we have left of life. Eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Wrong. They had been ignoring God. Now they are still ignoring God. Was there nothing they could do? Well, do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah went to that wicked city, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, with the message from God. Forty more days and Nineveh was destroyed. That's all that the book of Jonah tells us his message was. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. There was nothing that they could do, the people of Nineveh, to stop this judgment coming. And yet what did they do? They repented 
and cried out for God's mercy. And God loves to show mercy. That's what the Lord is like. That actually was what annoyed peevish prophet Jonah. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So what should the people of Jerusalem have done when they realised the city walls and the water tunnel weren't going to save them and there was nothing they could do to save themselves? They should have cast themselves on God's mercy. As Rahab the prostitute did when Jericho was destroyed and she and her family were saved. God loves to show mercy. He loves to treat us better than we deserve. Yes, he's a holy God and he does punish and we can't get ourselves out of that. But he is compassionate and merciful. We just need to turn back to him as our king and ask for his mercy. Jesus died so we could become God's friends. It's never too late unless we keep refusing the offer of his mercy. Sometimes I think the church today collaborates with the world's escapism, where the world says, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. People don't want to hear about sin and forgiveness, we're told. They want to be uplifted and feel good about themselves the way they are. But if we shut up about sin and forgiveness, if we deprive people of the offer of life, we encourage them into this attitude of escapism, even when they're starting to recognise their desperate position before God. We owe it to everyone to introduce them to God's mercy. The fourth error in Jerusalem, building a name and reputation for oneself but not recognising one's total dependence on the Lord. And I think this was probably a widespread attitude in Jerusalem, but one, one individual exemplified this attitude uh, seen in Jerusalem. His name was Shebna. He was in charge of the palace. We find that Hezekiah's tunnel wasn't the only expression of faithlessness hewn into solid rock under the city. Shebna's love of pomp went as far as planning a tomb for himself fit for a king. In contrast, another court official called Eliakim shows the characteristics of a true leader. And we read that God um, deposed Shebna and installed Eliakim in his place. Look at how they, these two men compare. Shebna was self-regarding. You could see that in, in his chariots and his tomb, whereas Eliakim is described as the servant of the Lord. Shebna is, is like a ball, unstable. God's going to throw him away. Eliakim is like a peg, stable. God's going to fix him in the solid wall and people can and hang up on it as a solid, dependable person. Shebna would then be disgraced and Eliakim honoured. Shebna would be deposed by the Lord, Eliakim fixed in a firm place by the Lord. Verse 23. So Eliakim is in so many ways so ideal as a leader. So there's a sad surprise in verse 24. I wonder if you felt the shock of it as we, as Jan read it to us. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and will fall and the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord has spoken. Maybe it's his own weakness. Maybe it's the failings of his family who hang on his glory like heavy items on a peg on the wall. But Eliakim is not up to the job of bearing the full weight of government of God's people. This happens all through the Old Testament. 
you keep getting what looks like an ideal leader and they turn out to be flawed. Isaiah's already told us back in chapter 7 what we need. The, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. His name means God with us. When he comes, Isaiah sees in chapter 9, to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and for ever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The people of Jerusalem needed Emmanuel. We need Emmanuel. Thank God he has sent us exactly what we need, or rather exactly who we need. God is with us. Emmanuel is Jesus. Let's affirm our faith in him together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name that you are both our provider and our provision. You give us all that we need for both our physical and spiritual needs, and you yourself are that provision, for you are the life and light, health and wholeness. You are the way and you are the truth. You are our saviour and you are our friend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our homes and families and all in any kind of need or distress. We pray for our universities, schools and young people generally at what would have been exam time for many. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We entrust to your tender care those who are ill or in pain, knowing that whenever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold them safe, comfort and heal them and restore them to health and strength. Give skill, sympathy and resilience to all who are caring for the sick and your wisdom to those searching for a cure. Strengthen them with your spirit that through their work many will be restored to health. Let us spend a moment thinking of anyone known personally to us in need at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask for your blessing on our mission partners, David and Heather and Mike and Vicky. Help them as they continue to share their knowledge and love of you in these difficult times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever-present God, be with us in our isolation. Be close to us in our distancing. Be healing in our sickness. Be joy in our sadness. Be light in our darkness. Be wisdom in our confusion. Be all that is familiar when all is unfamiliar, that when the doors reopen, we may, with the zeal of Pentecost, inhabit our communities and speak of your goodness to an emerging world. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Jane, for leading us in prayer. Do uh, send a text in. I've had a couple of texts arriving already. Now would be a good moment to send one and then I can read out. Um, if you'd like to say something to the church family, send a greeting. Um, I think this is quite an important way to keep um, our church family connected and uh, our church life going under the current challenge. Uh, Margaret White says, uh, sends in a text from her and Ian, good morning church family, love and prayers to all. And one from Bryn and Roseanne, trust everyone is keeping safe and well as we are, much love. Uh, we've had a um, nice um, photo I'll show you in a minute. Sorry that um, Ray's videos of his birds not working in the um, in the loop before the start of the service if you tuned in early but uh, it's been lovely to see the development of those blue tits from Ray's uh, bird box camera and uh, Ray has texted in enjoyed the sheep video to the hymn the king of love well done Hugh um, so yeah well done Hugh for finding these hymns and videos and getting the copyright permission to use all these different things we're really grateful for that and uh, it's helpful for us to have feedback as well because some things people are finding easier to sing along to and some things harder and um, we're trying to get actual singing rather than just instrumental accompaniment um, and this, so that's been great this week and enjoyed seeing um, Shepherd with a Land Rover and Sheepdogs uh, slightly different from the Palestinian scene and then uh, some quite English looking countryside um, which was lovely. Uh, the Zoom coffee time, God willing, will happen after this service. So do um, take a minute to get yourself a coffee and then tune in to Zoom meeting number. The meeting number's not actually on there, but uh, um, it'll come up at the end of the service, 449-344-829. If you've been to virtual coffee before, you, your Zoom should remember it. Um, and last week, as uh, we had been warned where Zoom all over the country and I think all over the world was having problems, uh, we didn't manage most of us to see and hear each other very much, but uh, it seems to be back up and running and that would be good to, to see one another. We saved Nigel's quiz from last week to do today, so looking forward to that quiz. Um, do phone uh, Phil Edge, Phil and Molly would love to pray with you um, either now or later. Um, we always offer prayer ministry in church after a service and this is the sort of equivalent to that. There's Phil and Molly's or Phil's mobile number 077 21 651 828. And here's a lovely picture of Vilma and John. Um, let's make that full screen and a message from Vilma. They've been having a challenging time, um, but thank you for that, Vilma and John, and so uh, God be with you. Um, during our next hymn, you might like to consider it to be the offertory hymn, as it were. Um, there, there are some bank details, which if you already give by standing order or have given by bank transfer before, you may already have. Um, that's the most efficient way to give, but you may find it easier to give by text. And here is the number. You, we better make that full screen, I think, because the edges are missing. Uh, that you text to the number seven zero four seven zero, whatever whatever it is you're wanting to give, and you choose one of these three amounts and text three Saint Nicholas to give three pounds. Or if you text three mission, that will go to Gideon's UK. 
um, via St Nicholas and uh, that's the mission focus that we've been supporting for a couple of months or so and we've heard about and prayed for and today is the last opportunity for giving through St Nicholas to Gideon's UK and we'll be moving on to mission partners next week um, so uh, that's, the, that's the details for text now and 333 pounds has been given for Gideon's UK so far God is the Lord of the years and uh, I love this hymn looking to him who's helped and guided us and so let's keep our trust in him and not in our defences, our water supply, our, our insurance, our pension, our health or whatever it is that he's given us but rely on him, the Lord of the years.
seeing we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. I'm reading uh, an ascension blessing and I've, I've read the wrong bit, so let's start again with that. Christ, our ascended King, pour upon you the abundance of his gifts and bring you to reign with him in glory and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. And so uh, we've got another blessing uh, now as well, which has been produced by uh, various churches around the country um, called the UK Blessing. It was circulating on social media a couple of weeks ago. You may have seen and heard this already. Uh, but we finish our service with this and then see you at Virtual Coffee and see you next Sunday on YouTube live stream.